<clears throat> well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you've had a too long uh, plenary lectures, uh, so I hope you are not too tired. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to, to give this plenary lecture. It's really a privilege uh, uh, and honor to be here um, and have the opportunity of, of, uh, of uh, presenting this work. I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-authors, uh, Colin Hare and Medad Pasha, who actually have done the job. So I've got just the pleasure of, of presenting the work here. Um, I thought I left the uh, weather of Leeds behind, uh, escaping to sunny Barcelona, but uh, didn't realize that actually weather of Leeds was following me. So um, we've had uh, uh, a good number of outstanding plenary lectures, and as an engineer, I have learned a lot about physics and mathematics of, of particles. And I've been reflecting, comparing what I have to present to you with, uh, with the fantastic computationally advanced methods for dealing with many particles, dealing with, uh, uh, with many pedestrians, dealing with uh, sand dunes, and, and all these aspects that we have enjoyed. How does this presentation differentiate from, from those? And reflecting on it, I thought probably uh, as engineer, we work for end user impact. And end user impact for us is, of course, around the environment of, uh, uh, of uh, industry. And it means that our work, to be credible for them, should have a realistic, quantitative, and reliable measure of whatever we do. And in that way, this constraint, in a way, is, is setting us to deal with things which can be a little bit challenging. In the sense that, you know, there is a famous motto of, uh, of tribologists. They say, what's the difference between uh, matter and surfaces? And say, matter was created by God and its surfaces by devil. And I think probably that really differentiates our work in particles. With, with particles, um, we are talking about shape, and we are talking about rough surfaces. So as an engineer, if we go to industry and say that we are modeling frictionless spherical particles, um, they basically discard our credibility in that it's not realistic for what you're doing. And in that sense, we are really grappling in terms of short-term challenges. I'm sure in the long term, we learn from the type of physics that was presented here. But in the short term, we are grappling with what to do with shape, what to do with the surfaces. And in giving results to industry, we are constrained by actually having reliable quantitative results. So uh, some of you may be familiar with International Fine Particle Research Institute. It's a charity organization which supports research in, in particle technology, supported by about 20 industrial companies. And uh, you may be aware that the work of Bob Behringer on, on jamming was, was supported by them for a while and also the work of Gabby Tardos at CCNY on, on quit flow was also supported by them. Uh, so having done this work, they uh, thought, can we actually have a prediction of this work? And so one of the company members, Procter & Gamble, fronted by one of its employees, uh, Paul Mort, um, applied to NSF to uh, basically engage uh, with some of the academics in USA uh, with a challenge to see whether they could predict the results of Bob Behringer for jamming of two-dimensional disks and the quit flow of, of uh, Gabby Tardo. So that was the challenge set by them. Uh, so a number of uh, participants were invited, uh, only from US, uh, to simulate either a 2D hopper or, or a 3D axial quet, and the primary goal was to validate and calibrate models against chosen experimental data set. So um, there were about five, six academics who entered that exercise, taking the challenge, and it turned out that simulations were successful in providing qualitative insight into the internal workings of the experiments. And quantitative stress field predictions proved more difficult, particularly for the case of, of quet flow. Bob Behringer's work using uh, disks, uh, spheric, uh, the rounded disks, probably was more closer in terms of simulation. But when you talk about 
quit flow and using sand, for example, that comes the challenge that sand is not sphere. And doing the DEM with spheres is not necessarily going to provide quantitative comparison. It may do qualitative. Actually, it turns out that for quit flow, even qualitative observation is not there because uh, Prabhu not uh, from Bangalore in India showed in the last powders and grains that actually there is a secondary motion of particles within the quiet flow, and that secondary motion complicates it. So even quiet flow cannot be a powder geometer. So in terms of flow, we are a little bit hampered by what we can do. And if you look at the papers in this meeting, there are lots of papers relating shear stress to shear strain, but we, don't, we didn't see many relating shear stress to strain rate, apart from the paper that I attended, Gene soon presented on, on suspensions in slurries. But what about dry powder? What about the cohesive dry powders in the size range where air effects are responsible for it? So these are areas where actually we don't have quantitative good comparison on it. So despite this fact, the quality of the insight obtained from this exercise was conceived to be sufficiently interesting to merit further work. And I, thought, I, I suppose that the challenge is to you as well. If you can uh, pick up some of the measurements that engineers have done to see to what extent you can reliably predict that, that is going to be a further advance in our work. So in my work, um, I'm interested in shape because I know that shape uh, influences the powder flow drastically. Um, and most of the DEMs actually use spherical particles. So, of course, in this meeting, we have seen an exception that there has been a good number of uh, papers on shape. So uh, that means that uh, with the current uh, computer power that we have, shape has become something that we can manage and, and tackle. And shape can be presented by a number of ways. Um, I have not meant to be exhaustive in looking at all that, but I've listed a number of them, uh, starting with, with rolling friction. The simplest way, uh, to, as we have non-spherical particles, interlocking is uh, one of the main mechanisms of enhancing uh, bulk friction. And the easiest way is uh, to use uh, rolling friction, where the contacts are uh, are prevented from rolling, and therefore the stresses are localized. And in that way, you artificially uh, um, simulate the, uh, the shape. Um, then we have the uh, uh, work of Anthony and Kuhn using uh, spheroids with different aspect ratios for modeling shape. Um, we have the work of, of John Favier, where uh, he proposed the use of overlapping spheres, and that work actually was expanded by, by, uh, by Genui, where there's extensive work on that. Um, some 30 years ago, maybe 35 years ago, Charlie Campbell introduced the concept of, uh, of polyhedra and looked at shear deformation and breakage of, of polyhedra. And actually nothing happened for a long while until later on his students, Alex Potapov, set up a company and he's now commercializing this code by the name Rocky. So I haven't used it yet, but obviously that is available. The problem with this is that the failure is on, on faces of the polyhedra. So the failure is artificial in the sense that you have, it doesn't have physics in it. You have to apply some failure and some stiffnesses to those faces in order to simulate it. So it is still, in a way, empirical. However, it's very potentially attractive for crystals. If you are interested in flow of crystals, or breakage of crystals, then because of the sharp corners and sharp facets, then it makes it very powerful. And in fact, for a number of industrial cases, like for example, pharmaceutical industries, most of the products, for purity reasons, they are produced in crystalline form. And then there is the issue of milling and, and flowing and blending. And most of the spherical uh, tools are not really applicable. For, for, uh, for crystalline modeling. This has got the potential, but somehow we need to give some physics into it in terms of defining how the material would fail. 
My colleague, uh, uh, Ja uh, in Leeds, he's developed what is called DigiPack, so he scans the shape of a particle by, for example, X-ray microtomography. And then he sticks Legos together, we call it voxels, he sticks voxels together to produce roughly that shape, and then models the uh, particle interactions in that way. Of course, the contact mechanics is not uh, um, the same level as, uh, for example, Hertz uh, Mindlin, but uh, for large particles, he, he shows that actually that type of uh, presentation is reasonable. More uh, complex uh, mathematical models is superquadrics of, of Paul Cleary, where that type of equation can be used to model the shapes that you see here. But these are, again, rounded shapes, and they differentiate that shape from, the, from polyhedra. So what has been done in the literature on these shapes? I'll start with... Uh, with the work of, of Joseph Anthony and, and Matthew Kuhn, who actually showed that for these shapes, the degree of anisotropy in heavily loaded contacts is particle shape dependent. Uh, uh, so he looked at uh, the obelisk and prolate spheroids uh, in 2004. Um, later on, uh, Jin Ui and his group, they actually modeled the flow of, uh, of shapes like that, made of, of two spheres with, uh, with separation distances, and they showed that bulk uh, uh, friction coefficient increases significantly with aspect ratio. However, this type of uh, model, uh, the roughness is also influential. So you change the aspect ratio and you change the, the roughness. Later on, uh, Colin and I looked at uh, keeping the roughness constant, keeping, uh, changing the aspect ratio, and, and also ch uh, changing the uh, roughness by, by basically using a larger number of spheres. And what we showed that uh, for the uh, sh stress ratio, then the stress ratio increases slightly with roughness, which is expected. And for the case of aspect ratio, again, stress ratio goes up, and then falls down because you get alignment of, of the particles on the shear plane. Um, recently, uh, Carl Vaskren, uh, in a group with uh, Bruno Hancock and Jennifer Curtis, they looked at pure shear of, of cylinders and see how that compares with, with uh, simpler models. So this uh, is a periodic boundary assembly applying shears, uh, pure shear at the boundaries. And what they show is that actually shape matters provided that you are operating at high volume uh, fraction. So if you look at the, uh, the uh, stress normal to the shear plane um, as a function of solid volume fraction, this curve is for kinetic theory, and actually one sphere, frictionless sphere, superimposes on that. But as you uh, increase the aspect ratio for cylinders, which are shown in here, and, and for glued spheres like that, initially at low solid volume, that is for collisional regime, by the way, at, so, at low uh, solid volume fractions, there is, the data are overlapping. There is no differentiation. But as you increase the volume fraction, at large volume fraction, there is a departure between glued spheres and, uh, and cylinders, with glued spheres exhibiting more stress on the boundaries. Uh, they later on showed that for, for dense flow, uh, the smoothness matters greatly. So in looking at the shear stress as a function of solid volume fractions, they modeled the uh, spheres of, uh, touching each other and overlapping. And you see that on overlapping, the uh, shear stress falls down significantly as a result of roughness on the surface. So that's basically a, a short summary of what I've seen in the literature. There is a lot, of course, ongoing on in this very meeting, uh, and we have uh, seen the work of, uh, of a number of groups uh, who have been doing uh, the shape modeling on that. So what we've been doing at Leeds, we, we've looked at three cases, so I'm going to present a uh, shape effect on, on three cases. One is the flow of corn seeds in a batch coated, and uh, yesterday I met Pasha, my coworker, he talked about uh, coating uniformity and modeling coating in that device, so I'll briefly uh, present that one because not everybody was in his uh, seminar. Um, uh, then I move on to uh, modeling of uh, a rheometer, which is called a Freeman rheometer, uh, widely used by, by industry to look at flowability of powders. Um, 
Again, uh, Colin here yesterday briefly presented that, but I'm going to address the shape effect for that. And then finally, I, uh, if there is time, uh, I move on to uh, uh, showing you what we've been doing for something which is really remote from spherical shape, that is ribbons, compacted ribbons. Like how can we analyze particle breakage in compacted ribbons? So starting with the flow of corn seeds, um, we are interested in flow, and that is really an issue because of the uh, continuous processes that we are dealing with. Residence time matters for, for production, and this type of quota is used extensively by seed industry, where the base is rotating, the, the seed is put in there, the seed is rotated, and then the liquid is put on a, on a uh, spinning disk where you atomize the liquid and it spl splashes over the surfaces of the seeds. And there are two import important features here. There are two baffles which basically turn over the bed and renew the surface such that the bed coats. And this is done within 20 seconds. So the residence time in the system is 20 seconds. However, it doesn't matter how long you do it, the spraying remains non-uniform. And that's the issue of what is happening, that the coating on the surface remains non-uniform. And that's something that uh, Medal has been looking at it. So here is a top view of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the corn kernels, which are moving. And here is the, uh, the baffle. So the baffle tears over the seeds and renews the surface for the liquid to arrive and, and coat it. And the region of interest is really before the baffle and after the baffle, because otherwise the, everything is moving as a plug flow, but the surface is renewed by the baffles. And that surface renewal is pivotal in providing uniformity of, of coating in the system. So Medal has been looking at radial and tangential velocity distribution in this one experimentally. So he's looked at a number of particles and, and looked at the tangential and normal velocities here. Uh, in order to actually see what we can do with the simulations and see what type of agreement we get with the simulations. So on the simulations, uh, we've been uh, uh, making an X-ray microtomograph of, of the corn kernel and then trying to approximate this shape by two ways. One is producing artificial rolling friction for a sphere, and the other one is to looking at producing a number of clumped sphere, as you see here, to build the shape. And this is done by ASG software. So the shape is built and optimized. And with the software, we can see what actually is, is not uh, simulating. So the white parts are not basically the areas which are not uh, represented. But that really depends on the number of spheres that you use. So we've been playing with uh, a number of spheres like that to see what is the accuracy of, of simulations with these spheres. So it turns out that. Uh, um, well, here is the, actually the um, uh, video of it. The seeds are uh, uh, introduced, and then they are rotated. And as you see here, they hit the buffers, they turn round, and with the liquid being introduced here, the liquid gets coated. And that coating, the uniformity of that coating or the coefficient of variation of the content of liquid on each particular seed is of interest because if one seed is coated too much, then it remains wet and can degrade. If it is uh, coated too little by the coated material, then it hasn't done the job. So um, we have been looking at the uh, particle velocities in these two zones, which are, these are the two zones of interest. And just to summarize what uh, the results here is that what you see is a little bit crowded curves, but the orange line is actually an experimental line analyzed by image analysis. And then we have the option of either artificially changing the rolling friction or using the spheres, the number of clumped spheres. What we find is that the number of clumped spheres doesn't matter. They all produce the same results. Between five spheres to up to 20 spheres, the results are indistinguishable. So we have used five spheres, and, and five spheres is actually what you see here, which is closest, that green one, which is closest to the, to the experimental line. Um, Tangential velocity doesn't matter. The particles move as, as a plug flow, so there is not much differentiation there. Radial velocity is what is actually responsible for renewing the surface, and you get good agreement with clumped sphere, and also with rolling friction, you get good agreement for rolling friction of 0.1. So radial velocity is nicely captured by rolling friction of 1 or 5 clumped sphere. 
tangential velocity is uh, the same for all simulations. So the conclusion here is that rolling friction can do the job, but a suitable value needs to be uh, determined by, by some sort of experiment. So it, the approach is empirical rather than predictive. Whilst with the sphere, uh, clump sphere, you can uh, not bother about rolling friction and it produces realistic results without uh, any parameter changes. So that's basically uh, one case. The other case that I want to present to you is uh, this uh, flow uh, energy measurement by, by FT4 uh, rheometer. This has got a, a checkered uh, history in that this rheometer is loved by industry and not uh, loved much by academic circles because the academicians ask, what does it actually measure? When you measure the flow energy, how does it compare with the type of measurements that we do in mechanics of uh, solids, like, for example, shear cell work? Um, now, the point here, the differentiation here is that with most cases where we use the shear cell, really shear cell is reliable for initiation of flow. However, when we are dealing with feeding a large quantity of material into uh, tableting uh, shoes for in pharmaceutical industry or filling capsules or filling uh, food material, then what really matters is the flow rate. And that flow rate is something that standard mechanical testing machines cannot easily do, or the measurement is not easily relatable. Freeman technology, they say that their flow meter can do the job. And for our curiosity, we decided to put that one into test to see whether we could understand a little bit about this device to provide some interpretation on it. So this device basically has got an impeller which penetrates the bed, and you measure the work of penetration. And Freeman uh, suggests or claim that the flowability is correlated with flow energy. And that is purely empirical. Um, they measure flow energy, and they say that the experience shows that it measures, it's correlated with, uh, with uh, flowability. Now, they measure the, uh, the work uh, uh, by looking at the tangential uh, and uh, normal force that is experienced, and then calculate the, uh, the, the work that is required. And then we were interested to see what it actually that means in terms of DEM. So we started with something that we can play with, having reasonably good uh, uh, confidence in the simulation, and that is we, gla spherical glass beads. We started with that, but we silenized the glass beads in a way that they become very cohesive, and we can manipulate the cohesion level by the methods of silenization. So we uh, measure the uh, uh, surface energy by this drop test method that we have developed at Leeds. And then used, uh, we have recently also developed an uh, elastoplastic adhesive contact model, um, which is basically the linearized version of Thornton and Ning uh, model, which is based on JKR. Uh, so we use that one where we can actually put that surface energy into the system. And in here we have uh, elastic stiffness, plastic stiffness, elastic recovery. And because we have plastic deformation, you have enlargement of the contact area. Therefore, the detachment force increases because of that enlargement. So we have used these values for the simulations. And lo and behold, because we are playing with spherical particles, you get a very reasonable agreement between experiments and simulations. What does it mean? Well, we are better informed, but I don't think we are non wiser because actually we still don't know what it exactly it means. Colin has looked at the uh, stress profile on the blade, and it turns out that actually the stress profile, the shear stress profile, correlates very nicely with the energy. But the point is that this is really applicable to what we've done now. In reality, we have fine powder, cohesive powder, with air influencing it. So simulation of, of, uh, of a real case is still beyond our, our means of doing it. But we could play with shape, and that is something that I'm presenting now. So we, we picked up some uh, mundane uh, material that you have in your uh, kitchen, the detergent powder, spray uh, dry detergent powders, as you see here, they have really complex shape. Uh, and the question is, what is the flowability of that? How does it compare with, with the spherical particles? So 
we used again the ASG software and, and modeled that by clumped sphere. Uh, so here you see the actual model versus the real shape. And the white parts actually using four clumped sphere are not really reliably um, simulated, taken in the simulation, but that is purely a matter of uh, time, computational time. You can use larger number of spheres and have a better shape, but we just played with four clumped spheres using a sliding friction of 0.5, and here are the results. You see that actually the flow energy uh, is almost doubled by moving from a silent glass beads, which are cohesive, to something like blown powder. Where do we go from here? I think the challenge here is looking at adhesive particles in the size range of up to about 50 or 100 micron, where air effects are, are responsible for, for the powder behavior. And that's where basically uh, Freeman technology claims that the flowability of powder is affected by these features, and at the moment, academics don't have the tools to play with it. And so that is really a development which comes uh, for, for future. How much do I have? Two minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, ha we have plenty of time for tea. <laughs> so, um, no, I think probably in view of two minutes, I just go quickly through this milling of, of roller um, compacted ribbons. One way in process industry dealing with cohesive powders is enlarging them. And there are two ways of enlarging, either dry granulation or wet granulation. So from a cohesive powder, you make it to large particles. Dry granulation is done by compaction in roller compacted. So you put the powder in a roller compaction, you produce ribbons like that, and then these ribbons are milled to produce the size of the particles that you want, which is definitely larger than 100 micron for improved flowability. So that's basically what is done. And we wanted to simulate that. Now, that's really the extreme case of, of simulation there. So uh, we decided uh, to use the, uh, a model like that, a number of spheres stuck to each other, because you can't actually look at breakage of one single sphere. The shape is not represented. And here, we use the bonding model of, of Jin Ui's group to bond the particles together. And then we determine the bond strength by doing three-point bend test, both experimentally and also by simulation. So you can do a simulation on that nicely to get the, the, the bond which matches with the experiments. And that way you get the bond strength and you put it in the model and simulate it. So basically, the approach was to do the bond calculation and then import the bond to, to the simulation and look at the velocity stress distribution in the simulation and then see how the particles break by subjecting real particles to those impact velocities and shear stresses. The point I want to stress is that we couldn't actually do the simulation of particle breakage to predict it because breakage is too complicated to be modeled by DEM. So what we do by DEM is to calculate the particle velocities and shear stresses and then subject the particles to those stresses experimentally to see what we get. So here is the mill, uh, and you see that the uh, ribbons are being dropped there, and then they, these rotating bars hit and they break them. And then we can calculate the impact velocity, the shear stress, and using these shear stresses, then we go experimentally. So that information is fine for DEM. Uh, this is the sort of profile of... Uh, of shear stress that we, quanti we quantify by DEM. And then we drop the ribbons, and you see the way they break at 2.75 meter per second and 4 meter per second. And so we then collect these ribbons and subject them to shearing. With the normal stress and normal strain given by DEM. So in a way, we use that information to, to calculate the amount of breakage. So we basically measure experimentally the breakage, but the applied level of stress and, and strain is given by DEM. Uh, and so in that way, we could uh, then analyze the particle size distribution. So we analyze the particle size distribution and see what we get with the plant data. So this is the algorithm for the particle size analysis. And then this is the comparison. So what you see here, plant data, as actually this is the data obtained in the plant. 
And these are the predictions by combined DEM and experimental work for these ribbon sizes and, and these RPMs. And you can see that in the short term, the comparison or the approach that we've done by coupling empirical experimental work with DEM has produced something which is credible for the uh, company that is using that type of work for controlling the size of the particles for the tableting machine. Because for tableting machines, you've got to feed the powder at a very fast rate. That means that the particles got to be very free-flowing. And that's really a challenge for, for the fast tableting approach. So here is, are the results on that. So these are the conclusions in what we've done. And in view of the time, I would go quickly through it, saying that in dense phase, when the particles break, then you have uh, a little bit complicated case. You have overlapping and bonded spheres would do the job. But in a way, really later on, polyhedra and faceted particles is something that we should, we should use. Acknowledgement, I would like to uh, thank Jin Nui and his group for the uh, uh, help they gave us to us for the, uh, for the contact model. My own research group have helped me a lot. And these are the companies which have supported the work. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.